This is Budapest, in the Central European University, where in the quiet corner of the campus a debate is taking place that affects us all. Everywhere, it seems, our education systems are changing radically. They're becoming privatized, and we hardly know what the outcomes will be. I'm here to join students from across the world to learn, discuss, and report. What are the issues of privatization in education? And why should we all be concerned about this uncertain future? My name is Carlos Ruano. I came from Buffalo, New York. My name is Alper. I am from Istanbul, Turkey. My name is Vaishal Miller, and I teach at uh, Appalachian State University. My name is Maite Gauto. I'm from Brazil. My name is Nomi Friedman Sokoler, and I work with the Palestinian uh, Organization for Alternative Education. My name is Mosin, Mosin Alatar. I'm a uh, senior lecturer at the University of Auckland. My name is Nathalie Wamba. I was born in DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So my name is Renato Anodezu, and I'm from here, from Hungary. My name is Camilla Chandlamant, and I'm studying at the University of Bristol. We're enrolling in a summer school run by PERI, the Privatization in Education Research Initiative. It funds research, shares knowledge, and encourages debate through its website, periglobal.org. Privatization of education is a truly global issue, but our experiences are very different, and we all come to the summer school with our own questions. I want to come here to get perspective from all corners of the world, find out what privatization uh, is looking like all over the place and connect my experience to other people's experience. The reason I came here was to understand what other people have learned from their own experiences in private and public education. I'm interested in seeing how uh, processes of opening the education market allow minorities to uh, and excluded groups to design their own education. I'd like to see how we can implement particular policies that are going to push back against the disempowering effect of privatization. We quickly realize that it's tough to even define privatization. By putting a sponsor into an academy or inviting a sponsor into an academy, are you privatizing that school? Potentially you're using a private sector partner but then equally you could use a civil society partner, a charity partner. But is that privatising the school? So I asked Dr Geoffrey Wolford of Oxford University to give me a definition of the privatisation of education. Privatisation of education is a very, very complex process and it means different things to different people and it means different things in different countries and in different situations. But it's basically a process from some form of schooling that is publicly funded, publicly organised, publicly regulated, to another form of schooling that is less publicly funded, in other words more privately funded, that is uh, less regulated by the state and probably owned by people who are not the state. Can you tell me what forces are involved with that increasing level of privatisation? Oh, I think there are very many. <laughs> um, there, there are very many forces actually happening here all at the same time. Already faced with a sense of the complexity of this changing landscape in education, I wanted to fill in the background. What are the fundamental drivers? The reasons why privatization is happening? I asked Dr. Susan Robertson of Bristol University. I think there are a number of reasons. Perhaps 20 years ago, we didn't have those commitments uh, around all children would have a right to education. So that's very clear that when we make that kind of promise, the Millennium Development Goals that will be um, supposedly reached in 2015, what that means is uh, very large numbers of children around the world um, have a right and states have an obligation to get those children into school in some way. Now. For many of those countries, there's a very large funding gap to, to get those children into school. So that would be uh, one dimension, one that, that's driving it. However, I think there's another reason as well, and that is that um, there's a, a very strong discourse around the state should not be a monopoly provider, that when the state is a monopoly provider, we don't have efficient schools. Okay? And so there's a very strong language around school efficiency. Um, but also I think the third uh, element that's driving it is quite a, a strong sense that um, 
Those who access provision ought to have a say in where and what they are getting from the state in terms of education. At the heart of the issue are questions about what education is for, who it is for, what are its intended outcomes for society as a whole. That is why we care so much about it. But what should we be aiming for in terms of policy? I asked Hugh McLean of the Open Society Foundations, the privately funded foundation behind the Perry Initiative. I think there are four questions that are crucial for me. Um, the one is the quality of the education system. An education system needs to be able to provide quality, whether it's preschool or tertiary. The second one is uh, equity. An education system is for all, of, all children in society, all young people. The third one is that uh, an education system needs to be cost effective. Um, and it needs to deliver those first two in a way that is most cost effective for the whole of society. And then the fourth thing I think that is crucial is um, what education provides for the whole of society. It's a site where you can deal with um, um, issues that are of concern for everyone, social cohesion, um, how to resolve uh, issues in society, how to build a better society, how to engage the citizens to make a society a better place. So I thought I'd take the first of these points, that of quality, and explore how privatization can undermine this essential goal. Surely one of the main arguments for privatization is that it improves quality. Once education gets primarily commodified and you then look at what goes on within the school and should the school allocate resources to one level of education or another or one strategy for teaching reading or another, the answer to that question becomes which one will generate a greater profit. So the commoditization begins to transform the way in which decisions about learning get made and transform them in ways that make learning a second or third or a fourth priority, not the high priority that I think learning ought to be in an education system. The public system in Brazil is fully funded by the government. Students of public schools don't have to pay fees, they don't have to pay for their, for their address, for their textbooks or anything. But uh, in terms of quality, it's a very poor quality education. What's been going on in Brazil is that we have all this private, growing private sector that is, that education is a business. Uh, I actually don't believe that in Brazil there is all these philanthropists that want to, to invest <laughs> their money in local education. No, they want to earn more money than they already have. And uh, the debate on public education is being mainly held by civil society organizations that are advocating for rights. Another fundamental is concerned with rights, the right of every student to access free, quality education. Education system can't be for some people and not for others, or for some more than it is for others. It needs to be for all children equally, and that's absolutely crucial, and it's a crucial policy goal. There's an irony here. Isn't education supposed to be the way we address inequality? The notion of the education system as a place where inequalities are rooted out gets buried by the commoditization of learning in which those who can pay get access and those who can't pay don't get access. If, if you have a, a society where people don't even believe in social justice anymore because of their own historical experience, then it's quite difficult to make them believe. Even, even the local, that can be a form of democratic governance locally, but even the local isn't necessarily going to be redistributive across. And it's only the state that can do it across. And we'll, so it, how interested is in, in how strong is the state in doing that? And once its role is weakened, who's left? In these debates, one thing keeps coming through, and it's really the most obvious of Hugh McLean's policy goals, the one that is driving the privatization process, that of funding, but is more subtle than simply considering the cost of schooling. So here's the, here's the pretty simple question. If education for all is a global commitment, who's going to pay for that? Whose responsibility is it to pay for that? And why is it that the global commit the commitment to education for all is not accompanied by some parallel commitment that says paying for education for all is a global commitment? It's not a, a 
kind of orderly steps saying here are the limits of this funding and here are the limits of this funding and where else can we look and what are the consequences of looking in that way, but rather an uncritical leap into that space that says, since these resources are not adequate and these resources are not adequate, we jump into this privatization space without thinking about how to manage or govern that. When you start with uh, a very stratified social structure and you ask people to, to shoulder the burdens of uh, investing in their own futures, they're gonna be people who can invest more than others. Um, and so as we increasingly expect people to privatize that burden, I think that inequalities and inequities are going to increase. You have to think about the costs to society. If you don't achieve um, social equity through education or you're unable to provide uh, an education system that has any quality. Underpinning all these features is the idea of education being a public good. But in the zeitgeist of privatization, does that idea still have any value? Where it boils down for me is how do we ensure that the state does not give up its role as a guarantor of the public good so that as it outsources, as schools get privatized, that we don't lose the sense of we're in this together. Public goods don't just happen. The public good emerging out of education emerges because we understand that it's worth fighting for. We have a sense, a vision of how to make it happen. We understand the kinds of knowledges and the experiences and the settings uh, that would make sure these things emerge. That's a public good. So if education is fundamentally a public good, one worth fighting for, then its future needs to be widely debated, not just in the ivory tower of academia, but everywhere. I've been teaching all this week and we've been discussing these issues and I can tell you there's at times heated debate and high tension. So my sense is that these debates should be happening in classrooms around the world and on street corners and in cafes and over the social media and so on. We seem to be in a game of catch-up. Our knowledge is far from complete and events are overtaking the debate. So there's a real sense of urgency here in Budapest. What's happening in many countries is that the whole organisation of the schooling system is being rearranged such that there are now more private schools and even when they're being funded by the state, the schools now have more elements of being private schools. We need to know what's going to happen. And we have no idea what's going to happen as a result of this. What are, what are these, the implications of all these decisions that we're making now? Do we even know, do we even know as individuals or members of institutions, what kinds of seeds are we planting for the future? I asked Joel Samoff why he remains optimistic about the future of education. On any day of the week, Whatever day we are, today is a Wednesday, and on a Wednesday, there are probably a million people in the world who are trying to fix their education system somewhere. And my optimism is rooted in that notion that people are concerned about education and work on education and will push to make the education system, whatever it is, wherever they are, wherever they're working, wherever they find themselves and their children, to make it better than it is now. And it seems to me it's powerfully the task of the researchers and the analysts to help make that happen. Very quickly, what are you, what are you going to do different now? When you go back to Turkey, what yeah, are you going the to do thing, Yeah, the thing is that like, I, I think uh, I, I, will, I will do my best to create like, a, a more intensive participatory like, forum in order to discuss what we are currently discussing here. There's a couple things that I've gotten out of this course. The most important one I find is the nuances between the public and the private. It used to be so very simplistic to me. One was good and the other one was bad. I don't see it that way anymore. As a result now, things are far more complex, things are far more layered. What I'm taking from this week is a more comprehensive framework for thinking about social justice that I can use as an advocate and as an analyst for looking at different kinds of cases in different places but always thinking about what are its social justice implications and impacts. We were among a lot of researchers and I believe that all this knowledge that's being produced can be and should be used politically.
in terms to improve the quality of education and access to education. We need to see this as something in common, worth striving for, we're in and on this planet as uh, individuals but in communities with social relationships and social responsibilities to each other. Now that is a public good in my mind. That is something that we have to create though. Policy making is a long range thing. You can't rely on a quick fix. It's always expedient just to satisfy voters. But if you're thinking about real policy, you have to think about a 20 year time frame. It's going to take that long to, to make a real difference for education. So it's absolutely crucial that the four dimensions that I mentioned, education quality, equity, that the costs of education are right, and that you have an education system that is for the public good, that those things improve from one generation to the next. That's the goal of policy. If the, any one of those dimensions gets worse over 15, over a 15 or 20 year span, you failed in all of your policy goals, no matter what you or the voters think. Thank you. We must not take as inevitable what is. We take what is as what is. And we think about what it ought to be, and then we work on how to get there. You didn't happen to get that, did you, John? I didn't. Good man. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, John.